I am writing to your website because of some strange going-ons about the place I own here in Prescott, Yavapi County, Arizona. We have the remnants of what used to be a working ranch from years ago. Some living livestock from those days, a few horses, a few Brahma, a couple of goats out there, and a longhorn I won in a bar fight in Mexia, down in Limestone County, Texas. And recently we think we have a Bigfoot around. We used to winter horses for people around these parts who were snowbirds, but no more because of the mystery disappearances that happen here. In fact, lots of mysterious things like that happen around the place, especially as fall nears and the weather cools, like September, October, and November. Nothing happens in summer out here. One notable incident was the disappearance of one of my best dogs, part pit bull slash shepherd Mick. He wasn't afraid of anything and was great watchdog for the lower pasture. He guarded the grazing stock and two sheep we used to have and the goats from the local mountain lions and bobcats. Now, you may say the dog wandered off, but he was 10 years old and never left sight of the main house. He was a devoted dog. Some have said a bear came in the forest at night and took him, but... My middle son found him exactly 14 feet up in the crotch of a pinion pine tree with his neck snapped. No teeth marks were found, no bear claw marks, no mountain lion tears, just a broken neck and tossed up into that tree. Or if not tossed, someone must have put the dog's body up in that pinion, which my son had trouble reaching. We all tried to explain that one. Now onto the sheep. I bartered with a half-breed for a ram and an ewe, and had them down in the grazing pasture along with the stock, horses, goats, and such. We only had them for a short while and they disappeared. For a while, we thought the previous owner snuck back here loading up the two, carried them off, but my wife ran into the fellow in the hardware store in town and talked to him about the disappearance. He came home that day with my wife together and we went looking for a sign. We found nothing that day, and I don't believe he had anything to do with the sheep disappearance. He told me a far out story that got me thinking though, which is why I looked up Bigfoot on the internet. Anyway, he told me of a place up in the Sierra, Prieta. Pandorasa Forest, where this Yavapi Indian woman ran her small flock of sheep into the company of a young cousin. A blue Merle Coolie and a Border Collie that kept her flock together at night, fending off attacks by mountain lions and bobcats, sometimes wolverines. This one season, the woman and her cousin were bringing down the flock down of the mountains from grazing. It was late October. Snows were expected. She said she was not feeling well and laid down in a grassy meadow to rest, but woke up when she heard the sheep bleeding, her cousin yelling and the dogs loudly onto something. The woman, sheep herder, said, escaping with a big ewe under his arm, the hairy man tried to fend off the biting dogs. Kick the one coolie dog. It's all to hell. This might be what befell my dog. She caught off the dogs and watched the hairy man disappear into the pines with his prize. He explained the hairy man to her was what we call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. She only told the story once to an elder and she won't speak of it anymore, but he mentioned they come down from the north in winter. Hearing the sheep hoarder's story, putting two and two together, my sons, the half-breed and I pretty much decided that we must have a rogue Bigfoot living somewhere near the property. I don't mind that so much. We don't mind sharing some fruit off our trees with him, but stealing a man's stock is another thing. I don't expect to put up with that. After reading up on your website, my boys and I, along with other dogs, packed a rifle in a scabbard and rode out recently in the morning during Thanksgiving week and covered the whole western stretch of the property line, looking for a sign. You would laugh, 
We looked like a posse in a B-Western. We worked the edge of the tree line for about two hours looking for a trail. We found one that led deep into the forest, a section none of us had ridden before. We worked the horses through there and around thick brush. Soon we came to a stream and stopped to gather our bearings and water the horses. Dismounting, I thought I heard someone cough. I asked and nobody heard it but me. My horse jerked up, snorted and became uneasy. Sensing something none of us could see, the other mounts followed. All of us were focusing on keeping the horses under control as they danced about bucking, kicking, and snorting. My sons thought mountain lion. I wasn't sure. We stood together there by the stream listening, calming the horses when the dogs started looking towards the thicket of thangled brush. Then the barking started in earnest, and they took off. Still, we couldn't see anything, but by now we all expected the dogs to tree a mountain lion. We couldn't follow. The brush was too thick, but the dog noise seemed to be about 20 yards into this thick brush and brambles. We kept calling and calling. Finally, the dogs returned and then took off again. Pretty soon, the dogs returned with tongues hanging out, breathing heavy. We leashed the dogs up and took them and led the horses down to the stream. The dogs settled down, but the horses didn't. And as we were making an effort to saddle up again, that is when it happened. There came this howl that lengthened into a scream that at first sounded like a Brahma fart, low and guttural, and drug out and ending up into a high-pitched drone like a woman screaming bloody murder. My body reacted with a chill. The goosebumps mainly because the scream was coming from very close somewheres in that thicket of brambles where the dogs had been. The scream was long and kind of dragged out, the kind of noise that gets your attention real fast. The half-breed yelled, Sayoko, which means Bigfoot, as he pulled the rifle out of the scubbard. By now, the horses were almost impossible to control. Then it got quiet. Not a sound, no birds, no crickets, no nothing. Everything was still, except for the horses. The dogs were now cowering between my legs and their ears pricked towards the thicket. Then, in the distance, we heard another scream. It must have come from across the next valley. Now, we are figuring there is fixing to be two of these Bigfoot. And I felt fear for the first time. The dogs started whining. My grown boys hurriedly saddled up. We followed and took off down the trail, heading at a full gallop, all the way home, a good hour later. Ain't never heard nothing like that vocalization before, and I've heard plenty coyote, plenty wolves and elks buggle, but never nothing like that before, and it wasn't no mountain lion scream. It was four times as powerful, if that was warning from a Bigfoot. We got the message. Having lived in the area for more than four years, I had become accustomed to and familiar with driving my ATV, a Honda 450 Foreman, in and around the Daniel Boone National Forest. I was 22 years old of age and I was dating a local girl who lived in that county her entire life. We will call her Pam. We left my house one October night, traveled to the end of my ridge road which is gravel then continued on the dirt logging road, no longer in use at the time, which is privately owned. This road, of course, was wide enough to have, at one time, accommodated trucks and machinery used for logging. This old road goes for maybe a mile to a mile and a half eastward before splitting into three separate roads, each having several arteries branching from them. We stayed on the eastward path that runs into the Daniel Boone National Forest. 
From this point, there is an old house trail that the locals use for their equine excursions. We had traveled the entire horse trail and all the logging roads many times. I felt intimately familiar with every nook and cranny of these paths offered. Pam and I motored down the horse trail at a leisurely pace due to the narrowness of the trail among the thick forest trees. This coupled with many twists and turns of the horse trail, one could rarely exceed 8 to 10 miles per hour. I know this was because the ATV had a digital mp3 readout that was a backlit for night travel. After two to three hundred yards we came upon a small pond that sits on the south side of the trail. This was a favorite spot of mine. Many times I would travel to this spot at night, turn off my lights and engine and just sit there and gaze at the stars and take in all the smells and the sound effects the forest offers. I saw my first shooting star while gazing up in the fall sky the year before in this very spot. This small circular pond sits in a very tiny clearing of the forest just off the horse trail, with the tree line only about 20 feet from the water's edge all the way around. I pulled around the side of the pond opposite the trail, under a clear and half moonlit sky. I turned off the engine and lights. I was oblivious that we had just parked near an entity that did not want us there. Fortunately, before we could even lift our butts off the seat to get off the ATV, there was a tremendous roar that came out from the tree line directly behind us, probably no more than 40 to 50 yards away. I was instantly terrified as this was a sound I had never heard. It was loud and near. Pam screamed as I started up the ATV and headed back down the trail toward home. Luckily, the trail back out of there lay right in front of us. Holding on to me from behind, Pam remained silent as we made our escape. As quickly as I could, and without hitting any trees, we made our way back to the logging road, a few hundred yards away. I never remember turning my body to look back, but I looked from side to side many times. This model ATV has three headlights. Two are in a fixed position on the four-wheeler's front, and the third is attached to the handlebars and thus turned from side to side several dozen times as we made our way back to the logging road. From the pond to the logging road, I saw nothing unusual on either side of the tree line, neither directly nor in my peripheral. But remember, the horse trail is on forest property and the trees much more densely populated. Even with the ATV's lights, and half moon my vision would have been severely limited. Neither of us shouted, spoke to one another during the retreat of the horse trail. During this time, I remember telling myself over and over that it must be some kind of animal or even bird that had made that awful noise. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we reached the logging road. It greeted us with a straighter, wider path and sparsely populated trees. Now comes to the recollection that haunts my dreams to this day. Having reached the logging road without seeing or hearing any signs that we were being pursued, and not wanting to wreck of course, I only moderately quickened our pace. Now on the south side of the trail something caught my eyes. I saw a dark figure running parallel to the road directly to my left about 30 yards. This thing was running on two legs. It looked like a very tall and very large human form. I looked directly at it for a few seconds, turned back to look at the road, and then turned to look at its direction once more to discover it was still there keeping pace with us. During the second and final glance at this being, which also just lasted a couple seconds, it was one of those moments in my life where you wonder if what you are experiencing is real or just a dream. I looked down at my large digital backlit speedometer. 22 miles per hour. Finally, a moderately sharp bend in the south of the trail. I had to slow a little. As the road straightened again, I floored it and for the first time, I turned my body to look to the left and a little behind to see if the curve to the left had allowed the creature an advantage, in case it was upon me or even in front of me. Nothing. 
It was not in close proximity to my left or rear. I even scanned the trees to my right. Nothing. I cocked my head to the side and yelled over to the sound of the engine. Pam, did you see it? These being the first words I had spoken since the encounter. She must have thought my abrupt acceleration was due to the fact that beyond the sharp turn in the trail we just passed, the road did become more straight and smooth. Her response in my ear was, I didn't see anything. Did you see something? I said no, with intentions of telling her everything once we reached my house. I slowed my pace and within minutes we were on the gravel road which led home. We went over the experience again and again that night, but I never told her what I saw. I sold my four-wheeler and moved into the city the next summer of 99. I purchased another ATV in 2000. I bought a trailer and pulled my ATV to the 49 exit off I-75 and do my riding in Laurel and Rock Castle counties. I hauled my ATV back to the area I saw the creature on a summer day in 2001. I was alone. I went to the pond and stood on the bank for a few minutes. I skipped a few rocks and then left. It was a beautiful day. As a naturalist with a particular interest in mammals, I have been investigating reports of unexplained predators and stock killing in southern and western Victoria, Australia for some time. I am not associated with any research group with a focus on cryptic animals, but with other independent researchers as appropriate. In the last few years, I have been given two reports of what appear to be hair-covered man-like animals in my research area. Intellectually, I have great problems with the idea of such animals occurring in Australia, but as I trust and respect the informants regarding these two reports, I thought it was best to make you aware of them. The first report I wish to lodge came from a work colleague of mine and took place in the early 1990s. Michael and his wife, both educated health professionals, and five-year-old son observed a meter high approximately 3.3 foot tall, hairy hominid at close range from several seconds near, for several seconds near their house in the bush a few kilometers near, in the bush a few kilometers north of Ballarat. The sighting was made late in the day, but in good light and initially at the range of only several meters. The beast ran away from them at a great speed, a speed they felt no human could move at. While it was quite short when compared to an adult human, it seemed quite heavily built and its forelimbs appeared to be disproportionately long. The hair was all over its body and about 5 centimeters long, approximately 2 inches, and the same length on the head and dark brown in color. The face was not seen and the ears were not noted. It ran from where they had disturbed it near the entrance to their drive diagonally across the dirt road that services the district into a pine plantation and crashed through the undergrowth. The ground was too hard for tracks. It made no sound nor left any odor. Interestingly enough, at the time their son said he had seen it before. Now, however, he has absolutely no memory of that event and his parents don't like to refer to it. The other event related to me took place in the Otway Ranges west of Geelong near Tomahawk Creek. The observer who wishes to remain anonymous told me that in about 1989, he and three other mates all in their late teens were heading off for a night on the town in Kolak in a battered sedan. It was already after dark so they were making good pace along the gravel road through the state forest so as not to waste too much beer drinking time. Descending a steep hill, it was necessary to break and gear down before ascending the coming hill. As they got to the bottom of the gully, an enormous man-shaped animal started to cross in front of them, but stopped and retreated. My informant, who was a passenger in the left front seat and the two lads in the back seat, all saw the animal and were in shock for a few seconds, but not the driver. 
The passengers all panic and beg the driver to get moving. The driver thought at first they were joshing, but soon got the message. None of these boys wanted to talk about it, and I could get my informant to discuss it only once. They had never heard any talk about such animals in their district before or since. The animal was described as much taller than a man, maybe 2.2 meters tall, approximately 7 feet tall, and very broad with arms proportionally much longer than a human's arms, but legs compared to torso roughly the same as human. It had no real neck and its head was not exceptionally large. Face was not seen, but hair covered the whole body and was very long. The hair on the arms was described as hanging and very evident. In the headlights, he could not truly discern a color, but it may have been gray. My informant said it retreated very quickly. He felt it had tried to beat the car, but misjudged their speed. He has avoided that spot ever since. My sister, Natalie, and I decided to take the four-wheeler out after dark against my father's words. We followed the trail from our property into the McMillan Marsh. There, we were able to run along a dike system between water reservoirs. It was midwinter and my sister, Nats, was driving the four-wheeler and I was riding shotgun behind her along the dike. It was lightly snowing dark grew in fast and we were suddenly surrounded by darkness and snow with two headlights to show the way. Suddenly, a large seven to eight foot creature walked up onto the dike in front of us about 50 yards away. It stopped, turned, and looked right at us. We both noticed how the wind blew the long light brown hair, about a foot long, on its side apart, and it was white underneath as the hair parted from the wind. Our four-wheeler knights were not high enough to see the face, but it had a large, muscular chest and arms and walked like a man. The chest was a little more hairless, so that you could see rippling muscles under the dark hair. It had very long arms and did not walk like a human. It sauntered along, totally unafraid of us. It swaggered with very long arms swinging at its sides, and then went off the dike and into the wilderness. We were shocked and horrified. We sat in shock and then throttled over where its location was. There were very large footprints in the snow. We hurried home and never told a soul until years later. We compared what we saw, and our stories were exact. We will never forget that night. It was not a wolf, a bear, or anything human. I stand by that with my soul. If it were just me, I would have blown it off as a figment, but Natalie has every detail to the exact of my own. This is a report from the wife of a guy I work with. This is my first report since being a Bigfoot researcher. Here is the story as it was told to me. Around 15 years ago, me and my friend were horseback riding alongside the FEC railroad tracks between SR-207 and King's Estate Road. We were heading south towards King Estate Road when we noticed a smell like something was dead. I thought maybe it was a hog or something that died in the woods. We heard branches breaking like something was in the woods, but didn't pay much attention to it. Then the horses started to act up. Horses were blowing and snorting and rearing, and I just thought that they were being bad and difficult. As we passed that area, the horses acted better, and we went on down the side of the track still heading south. When I heard the sound of the rocks on the side of the track sound like someone was walking up on them, I told the friend I was with, don't walk the horses on the rocks, and he said I'm not. Just then, I turned to look around. She was just behind me to see what it was. That's when we saw it. It was about 150 yards away from us where we just passed. 
but standing in the middle of the railroad tracks. It was in some sort of crouched position, and not all the way down. Like it just saw us and froze and stared at us. What I saw was slim and covered in reddish brown hair. It had long arms and I could see the eyes a little. It was at least six and a half feet tall and around 250 pounds or better with no neck. It was getting dark out so we couldn't see any detail on the face. All the time that we saw it, we had to fight the horses to keep them under control. They didn't want any part of whatever it was and neither did we. So. We got out of there, and I never went back riding there again. It wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a man, unless he was covered in hair from head to toe. Here is the story as well as I can remember it. Approximately 27 years ago, around 1983. Now, if my memory serves me right, this incident happened during the summer of 1983. We lived on Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, and my spouse had just been transferred overseas right after the birth of our child, and I was waiting to move overseas with him once he was settled. So, the approximate time had to be around mid-July through September, 1983. Additionally, I cannot remember exactly whether a hurricane was approaching or it had just passed our area, but it was around this time. But fortunately, I do remember that the hurricane did change its course and headed up north along the eastern coastline, bypassing our area. This could help establish the time frame and verify when this incident occurred and to perhaps acquire a copy of the television news report if one was still available. My mother, recently deceased, had traveled down up from the north to visit and help out. Now both my mom and I were watching the local news when the news station reported that a horse was killed near the Everglades on or near some farm. The place where this occurred was by the southern Everglades area, bordered nearby the base. The news report televised showed the horse's head completely torn off of its body, ripped apart from the horse's body like a piece of paper. The horse's body was intact and so was the head. The horse's head was just lying there separated from the body. The horse's body showed no signs of scratch or claw marks, chain marks, etc. An investigator scientist or biologist cannot recall what the exact credentials were stated that he believed it could have been possibly done by a bigfoot who perhaps suffered some sort of personal loss its mate dying for example also being reported and shown was that there were no signs of other tracks tires or heavy equipment eliminating the possibility that the horse was mutilated by some sort of machinery or killed and dumped there as to seek some sort of retaliation to the owner of the horse. The investigator did point to a very large footprint in close proximity in the mud, which was reported and shown on air also. A friend of my wife told us about one of their friends who had an encounter. I got in touch with him and he agreed to relate his experience. I was very interested since it occurred in my backyard, in Sulphur Canyon, off the Caribou Basin, south of Soda Springs, Idaho. It was mid-late November of 1967 or 1968. He was on a late deer hunt with some companions on snowmobiles. Heavy snow was falling, but it was calm. The man had shot a deer and was dragging it back to the snowmobile when across the canyon he could just make out a figure coming down the slope about one-fourth mile distant. He thought it was his friend, a big guy, coming to help with the deer. It continued to approach and he left the deer laying in the snow to walk down to meet his friend. The figure didn't seem to notice him until it was within about 35 yards. Then it saw him and stopped with a look of surprise and an oh shit expression on his face. It had human-like features and a look of intelligence. Not like going to the zoo and looking at a monkey. 
It stood very erect, was six and a half feet to seven feet tall, and was covered with a silver coyote colored fur about three inches long, longer on the backs of the arms. He felt no threat from the creature and both turned and retreated out of sight. He emphasized that Hugh had spent a lot of time in the woods and he knows what he saw. A Mrs. Ruth Steele believes she has seen a Sasquatch three times in the past six months at Dory and Dryad along River Road. Farms are scattered throughout the semi-forested area and she drives the road nearly every evening. Steele described them as gray, white, and sometimes black fur covered and about seven feet tall. The faces of the upright animal appear to be pink skin. Her first sighting occurred in 1996 and was a dirty white creature six or seven feet tall. The most recent was in January of 1997 and the animal turned and looked at her car with eyes that shone red. Steele was accompanied by her daughter, Deborah Steele, 41, last November when the latter saw a creature loping along by the road swinging one arm. It looked right at her and scared her badly. Steele thinks they are migrating toward her home because each sighting is closer to where she lives. I live in Alpine, Utah. I have lived here my whole life. It's a small valley surrounded by the Wasatch Mountains. My encounter happened when I was 19 years old, right before I left on a LDS mission for the Church of Jesus Christ on Latter-day Saints. There is a canyon no more than 10 minutes from where I live. It's called American Fork Canyon. I was with two of my great friends, who have also served LDS missions. I was about to leave for two years. I love the outdoors, so I wanted to spend my last couple of days camping up American Fork Canyon with my friends. It was Friday, June 27, 2008. We found a place to camp a little bit north of Tibble Fork Lake. It's very peaceful and calm. It was getting dark and we just finished up fishing. My good friend Austin Hansen went to set up the fire, while his brother Alex and I went to the river below to clean off the fish. I remember Austin later that night telling us he saw someone walking in the brush by all of our camping gear. He didn't say anything. He just saw a big figure. He thought it was someone looking for something near our campsite. We came back and started cooking the fresh fish we just caught. We sat down, started talking about girls, our future, and while we were there talking we heard a faint eerie whistling noise. We didn't think much of it, maybe thinking it was some kind of weird bird in the trees. Maybe we had camped too close to its nest and we were bothering its family. It was a far off distant sound. At times it sounded like it was behind a bush listening to us. The closer it got there was also a weird smell that accompanied it. It also felt to all of us that the eyes were on us. Curious eyes watching and listening, as if we didn't belong in this area. As we were getting ready for bed, I walked off maybe 10 yards to where we were going to be sleeping to go to the bathroom. I thought I saw someone maybe 40 yards away it was walking right behind two big pine trees, and it stayed there for no longer than 30 seconds. Then I heard a stick at a tree two times, but the sound was coming off from the northeast from where I was standing. That's when I saw it. Whatever you want to call it, but I know what I saw. I saw Sasquatch standing upright walking towards the tree. It was standing at least seven feet tall, not intimidated by any means. It looked at me, or in my direction. My heart was pounding as the whistling noise got loud, very loud. I ran back to camp, telling my friends what I just saw. They believed me, telling me they felt the same way as if they were being watched. Austin told us the event earlier, seeing a huge man walking away from our camp. 
We got our things together and ran to the car. That late Friday night and is something that I will never forget as long as I live. I was told this story 20 or more years ago by my mother who passed away May 2006. It came up in conversation during which we were not discussing Bigfoot, but she retold a story that my grandfather had told her and her siblings 65 or 70 years earlier, roughly between 1916 and 1921. My grandfather and grandmother were Greek immigrants that worked in the fruit canneries in the Central Valley in California and my grandfather worked many years for the Southern Pacific Railroad doing track maintenance and building railroad track. My mother told a story that was refuted by her and her siblings when my grandfather told it. These were children of the early 1900s going to school by and trilingual. As my mother told it, when grandpa told the story they were convinced that he was telling a tall tale, primarily because they all learned in school that there were no apes in North America. The story goes, Grandpa was working for Southern Pacific Railroad building track in the Northern California, Oregon border area in the early 1900s. I do not know the year during this work project. He was dispatched to work on line camp in the woods. They had a base that the work crew worked from and each week the work crews would split into two man teams that would work on an area clearing logs and ground at the end of one week they would go back to the base to check in and replenish their supplies and then set out for the weekend for another week in the woods. During this time one of the two man teams came back to base with only one man. They were told that the other man had disappeared. The group at the base camp apparently gave a brief search but to no avail. The next week the crews went out in two-man crews and continued to work on the railroad line clearing. Some weeks later, I am not sure how long this was, as the camp moved north and the group of railroad workers came upon the missing man. He was naked and hysterical and crazed, and apparently died soon after he was found. He told of being abducted by a female ape that kept him in a large open pit. During the time he was in the pit, the man told of being forced to have sexual contact with the ape many times and said that the ape kept him in the hole or pit by licking his hands and feet raw so that he was not able to escape from the pit. Apparently, my grandfather saw this man's hands and feet and they were completely raw. My mother and her sisters and brothers laughed at my grandfather as someone who was uneducated and unable to understand that this was implausible due to the fact that there are no apes in North America. I always found this to be intriguing. Uh, has anybody reported a similar story? My mom told me the story of her sighting of Bigfoot when her and my father were on their way to my aunt and uncle's house somewhere on the outskirts of Ada, Oklahoma in the late 1950s before I was born. It was just the two of them traveling down a dark country road when my mom says that she saw this elusive creature making its way across the road. On the passenger side of the road, and that within a blink of her eyes it was gone, my dad completely missed the sighting. She said that it seemed to look over at them toward the car and hurriedly made its way down the embankment until it disappeared into the thicket. Every now and then I still ask my mom about what she remembers seeing that night, and her story remains the same. She described it as being a large hairy creature that walked upright with extremely long arms that swung from side to side as it steadily made its way into the woods. This story, like so many others, confirms in my mind that it is fact and not fiction but it continues to be just as mysterious today as it has for so many years now. When it's your mom telling the story, you know that there is something very real out there that has been able to evade us for centuries and continues to elude most of the human population 
with only those occasional rare sightings. That keeps the rest of us wondering what it is or if it's actually real. As for me, it is still a mystery, but I do believe my mom saw the creature that the rest of us have only heard of, and I happen to hear about it firsthand. In 1980 and 1981, I was working as a security guard on a high tension tower project here in California. I met a man who was a cat skinner operating a bulldozer, leveling off the pads where each of these high tension towers was to be placed. I noted he had on his pickup truck 25 to 30 decals from places he had been hunting and introduced myself. During the conversation I mentioned Bigfoot and he told me that in mid to late 1970 he was doing a little poaching with the forestry officials permission in a locked and gated area near Bishop, California. They had given him a key so he could go in anytime he wanted. This particular time the gate was still locked as it always was. He let himself in and his four wheel drive pick up to the area known as Four Points. He drove over a hill, and there, to his surprise, were a department of the Interior Vehicles and Bureau of Land Management men, all in their Smokey the Bear outfits with guns, searching a campground, the hills, the mountains, roads, etc. They grabbed this hunter, took his deer rifle away from him, and questioned him for seven to eight hours as to what he was doing there. The local forestry officials identified him as a trusted friend and he was let go, but told to never come back. He had determined during his interrogation that the reason the BLM and Department of Interior were there in force was that a Bigfoot creature had gone through there the day before, had torn up the campground, had turned over a large trash container, the type that you find behind large department stores, you know, kind of like dumpsters that no man can even begin to move and had killed several people. Over the years the story was passed through several people. Quite a few Bigfoot researchers but no one was able to come up with a single clue. Then in early to mid 1991 a young student also interested in investigating the Bigfoot mystery called the CBFO's hotline to tell me that he had heard the story several years ago and it had always stuck with him. He went on to relate that when he was doing some Bigfoot research in the town of Bishop, California, Inyo County area in 1989 and 1990, he met a former policeman who said that he was on the Bishop Police Force in the mid to late 1970s. The student related that foregoing story of Bigfoot to the ex-police officer from Bishop and he confirmed it. The officer said that the story was the talk of the law enforcement agencies in that area at the time but they were under tight orders not to say anything about the incident and related deaths. My name is Cheryl, a Mohawk Indian who grew up on the Onondaga Indian Reservation. I'll never forget when my cousin and I saw Bigfoot. We were both 11 years old on March 11th, 1975 at 11 a.m. We left my aunt's house that morning and decided to cut through the woods, thinking it would be safer than two girls walking along the road. Throughout our walk, it seemed that we were being watched. We finally arrived at the halfway point of our journey when we reached the local abandoned gravel pits. I slid down the embankment first and my cousin followed. I started to play on the frozen mud puddle when she started to climb back up the hill to retrieve her glove. She called for me to come near her but didn't right away until finally her persistence frightened me. She grabbed me close and said a big black arm just tried to grab me. Thinking that maybe a hunter had followed us or even a black man was lurking in the woods frightened us enough to make a run for the road. As we got to the road, we both saw this big figure walk through six to eight foot sumac trees. Its head and shoulders were over the tops of the trees, 
We could imagine how it could have traveled to the other side of the pit, which was at least 150 feet from where she first saw the arm. We ran the rest of the way home and told our family we had seen Sasquatch. Of course, everyone laughed at us. As the years passed by, we told the exact same story and our families believe us now. Looking back, I have concluded that Bigfoot was heading towards an underground cave that is sacred to the Onondaga. I believe that this cave connects other Indian reservations by underground channels. Indian legends tell stories that Bigfoot is a spirit that protects the Indians. That is probably why no one has ever found any proof of its existence. I have had many dreams about Bigfoot.